he's been described by his colleagues on the other side of the political divide as a liar and propagandist. And he however described himself as a student of life. He was expected to transform the agriculture sector as a minister of food and agriculture. But do these figures paint a different picture? Honorable Fifi Fiavi Franklin Quete, Member of Parliament for Ketu South Constituency is my guest tonight and we will discuss the agriculture sector under his watch as well as seek his thoughts on the Kwesibuche report and other internal issues of the National Democratic Congress. You are watching The Hard Truth. My name is Nana Akwesia Kunidu Asante Samuels. You're watching The Hard Truth and I have in the studio Member of Parliament for K2 South Constituency, uh, Honorable um, Fiavi Franklin Fifi Kweti. Fifi, how are you? I'm very good and Welcome happy to be to here. Welcome to The Hard Truth, sir. Thank you very much. And how is minority side treating you? Uh, we've been there before, so uh, to understand it's are not really... Are you not surprised really... or are you, are you in shock? No, I'm not, in shock, I'm not, I'm not you in know, shock. when yeah, things went down. No, I'm not in shock. Um, I think generally, deep down, everybody understands that in Ghana, at least from 1992 to now, the maximum number of times a party does is two. Uh, so, so you said you're two years. Uh, so generally, we we had the opportunity to my, serve two times. So we you, clearly no, no, were pushing but, but you, for you, another you time. Said, but you specifically, was, uh, Fifi, you know, said um, on on several occasions that oh, this is our first time. Let's press the Muhammad's first time. So we. But that's the truth as well. A second time. That's the truth about mm. President Muhammad. That was his first time. Uh, but as a party, uh, that's our second time. And I think the people of Ghana. Obviously, you look at it in terms so of the party it wasn't rather really than in line the with the no, it's personality. Yeah, you know, yeah. did we vote for the personality or we voted for a party? Uh, invariably, I think we vote for the party. We vote for the party. What, the people of Ghana. Do you think Ghana was tired uh, with the personality you guys presented, or even with the party? You saying we voting for the party? We voting for the yeah? Party. I think it's the party fundamentally. People vote for the party. At the end of the day, they view you've given an opportunity to. So was Ghana tired? Were we tired? Oh, we need an MPP now. Do you think that was the um, the norm or the mantra? People were singing safe song. We should um, actually change. Uh, I think even if you view uh, the United States, a far more advanced yeah. democracy, even they somehow have uh, been with this eight-year mandate. That's a that's a much more advanced democracy. So you can appreciate that, that the people of Ghana, after eight years, kind of feel why not you give another opportunity to, to, to else. somebody else to see what a person can do. Beyond that as well, MPP came with a lot of promises, and I think somehow, especially you, you young, you could have done the same. Yes, I agree. But you know, oftentimes when you are in government, you face far more reality. When you're in opposition, you tend to you tend to be more desperate. And the desperation leads you to make promises often that you, deep down, you clearly know are going to be difficult. Uh, in government, you can't be making certain promises because you really know what the, what the facts are. So I can appreciate uh, uh, the promises the MPP made, uh, which were really very desperate promises. Well, if you, I, and, I uh, can see it. You're not doing bad or well. I mean, you're looking very well now. So I'm not I've, sure always, I've always looked very good. <laughs> but my secret to... has always been my thoughts. My thoughts are always very good. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Fifi, prior to the election, 2016 election, you indicated on several occasions that the NPP, they were never coming back to power. In fact, you even quoted, or you were have quoted to have said that they will remain in opposition forever because of uh, the song from Vigi on to <laughs> the NPP, Charlie. You know, you, you quoted that. Now, despite all your prophecies, mm -hmm. the NPP defeated your party mm -hmm. by a wide, huge, huge, huge margin. Mm -hmm. Would you say that, you know, you read the situation uh, uh, wrongly? I mean, the thing is, is uh, entering into a battle, you need to go with confidence. And uh, if it was simply an issue of um, the development that needed to be provided for Ghana, I think NEC would have caused it to victory. Because this performance um, of uh, the eight years in terms of real development, I don't think any government in our history can match it. Now, so obviously we read and believe that if the people of Ghana fundamentally have always been after development, we provided them. So we are confident in that. But obviously, 
the people are going to. What was it again? Want you, you, like. Again, you, 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 you said earlier that if you're in party, um, you know the situation on the ground, hence you know the promises or the things you you give to the public or mm -hmm. you say to the the Ghanaian people. But you were super confident. I mean, in all your utterances, in all your appearances on TV, radio stations, and and wherever you spoke, you had that vim. You had that boldness to say that, guys, or Ghana. This guy, Akufuado, and his NPP party would never come to power again. What were the signs? Apart from you saying that Ghana, um, um, we were fed up or we want an 80 year term, we need an, an ex person, a new figure in the, in the system. What, why did you say that? No, first and foremost, um, we need to appreciate that um, no politician can claim to be God. Now, so if a politician say I'm going to win, doesn't make it a uh, fait accompli. So what is it? Is it propaganda? So, it's not propaganda. I mean, Hillary Clinton, Obama were confident that they were going to win. They lost. Mm. In 2008, Akufuado, President Kufo were confident they were going to win. They lost. In the year 2000, President Rawlings, Prof. Mills were confident they were going to win. We lost. Mm. And so that's nothing to do with. Um, so how did you how did you feel when it became apparent that uh, your party, you know, was losing the election? How how did you feel? Oh, like every politician, I mean, you. Or generally, I think generally about life, mm. you enter into every endeavor, uh, believing you win. If it turns the other way, you are disappointed. Mm. That's normal. But um, having having been. Uh, shall I call it in this uh, political game for a while and of course having played a key role in uh, winning in the year 2008 I do understand that in this game things change and change quickly and the people of Ghana make that final decision. I, 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 I mean if, if you say political game I will take offense because you are managing a nation and that should be taken seriously. A game is when you try to do something you that win or lose. So if you really again say wanted to actually change things for the better you would have rather put in more effort. So again did you see the whole thing as a game from what you just saying? No I mean when I mean game I'm talking about election. Election is a political game. It's just like a football game. You go into a contest, it's a game. And in that game, you win or you lose. Mm. So I'm not talking about the governance of a country. The governance process is different, but the election process itself is a real game. A game in which you give your best shot, your opponent gives the best shot, and at the end of the day, one wins. Uh, in this case, MPP won. MPP won because the people of Ghana felt they needed to be given an opportunity. If you maintain your, you retain your seat as the member of parliament mm -hmm. for uh, your constituency, K2 South, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but there was a huge drop, you know, for the vote for you. We had about um, um, 77, 8, 37 votes mm -hmm. in 2012, represents about, um, I think, 8.9%. 8 Vote in 2016 was just about 65.47%. Uh, uh, that was the total vote. Does this, you know, decrease or uh, in votes, you know, gradually or imply that you are gradually losing your constituency seat? No, not really. I mean, um, we need to appreciate that uh, first and foremost, the presidential vote itself uh, was 81,000 the previous time. And this time it came down to roughly about 68, mm -hmm. maximum 70. So even the presidential vote did drop. So you can understand that really was also happening all over the country. I mean, votes dropped because I mean, uh, either constituents uh, didn't turn out that fully, not just in one constituency, but across the country. Uh, in terms of the parliamentary, the reason why there was um, uh, a difference between what the president got and what I got was because there was an independent candidate. And that independent candidate was somebody who tried to stand on the ticket of the NDC and was disqualified. Mm. So naturally, uh, in this context, but you that must they're quite close. It was quite close to yeah, 40,000 over. You're still, you're still beating comprehensively. <laughs> and in game, that's it, in politics, even if I beat you by 100. So you, you don't feel game. you are losing your constituency? No, at all. At all. After losing the election, your, your party, the NDC, um, set up um, was a court of Christie committee to find out the reasons for the loss. And the committee presented the courts, uh, the, the reports to the party, I think, last month. What are your thoughts on the report? Oh, I think it's important um, after um, going through uh, such a difficult process as losing an election, there's a need to do some kind of post-mortem to find out what the real problems are, and especially giving opportunity for party supporters across the country to mm -hmm. ventilate and let people know what they are 
real sentiments are. I think that's what the that's what the uh, Butcher Committee did. So, if there is one particular advantage in it, was to give room for people to express and to ventilate. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Two would be some kind of dispassionate analysis because you know what I mean. In the process of losing, people have different reasons why. Everybody's feeling this is the reason, that's the reason. Nobody's right completely. Everybody has some amount of fact. Everybody is also wrong to understand. So I think the aim of the committee will be to put together these various facts and be able to do a much more, shall I call it, a quiet discussion in order to really know what the issues are. I think generally they've done a good job, but uh, I don't particularly think that the recommendations per se uh, are comprehensive. I think at the end of the day, each individual in the party needs to do his own deep introspection. When I speak to people, the impression I get is everybody feels somebody else is a problem. I think the best answer is everybody to accept his part in it. Uh, the ordinary voter in my constituency need to accept that he has a problem. And then I, as a leader in my constituency, need to accept I have a problem. If both of us can make that admission, then we are on our way forward. But if the ordinary voter feels he's absolutely correct, he hasn't got a problem, the only problem that came with me as a leader, then it's a problem. Because next time, he will repeat the same mistake again. So I think once we can have the party structures understanding them, then at least on the part of the party, there will be, if you, be We all again. understand that if one is voted into power, you are given a certain mandate. Mm -hmm. um, so you as a member of your constituency, um, you, a leader of your constituency, sorry, you are expected to take care of developmental projects to make your constituents happy at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Now, we are talking about, uh, you you're telling me right now, everybody needs to do their part. Mm -hmm. Let's go back a bit. Let's look at the part of the, the electorate or those who are supposed to vote mm -hmm. for you. Don't you think that if the constituents are happy, if you give them jobs, if um, their lights were working or the ECG problem was fixed, little things like that, everyday things were done for them, would have been easier for you to see numbers, people queuing up to vote for you and even your party at large? Yeah, I mean, if, um, if all things are equal, that should be. But the truth is that, um, I don't think there's any country where you find um, every single developmental aspiration met by anybody in power. It's not possible. Because in the course of um, managing the affairs of any country, or even of a district or a municipality, you are definitely going to come up with challenges. And those challenges make it impossible for you to do every single thing. Now, let's say, for example, there's a community uh, in my constituency, and in this community there's a need for a school, there's also a need for a road, there's also a need for electricity, and there's a need for water. Those are four main needs. And uh, over the course of, let's say, four years as an MP, uh, I've been able to help re get electricity for that community and school for that community. But there's still the need for water and there's still the need for road. Or there's a need for, for I mean, two, I'm missing out of four. You will get some members of that community showing an appreciation because they are looking at a, a, a half what you call a, a half full glass, right? The other people who don't turn on and say, no, we didn't want the four, he didn't give us four. We are because he promised four. No, no, that's not the case. Nobody goes promising four. Nobody does. At least I know for the fact that I don't go doing such things. What I always endeavor to tell people is, is that, listen, these are the things that are needed. We will do the best we can. But that's all we can do. It's the best all talk. We'll do the best for you. Nothing happens. Is that all talk and no action? It's not possible to spend four years in power and not do nothing. In fact, even the most useless, Fifi, the most useless government Fifi, would what, do something. what did you do? What have you done in your constituents? In terms of development projects, we've, I would say, without boasting, okay, that in four years, uh, the numbers of development projects sent to my constituency have never been sent before by any previous MP, and that's a fact. Anybody can check that for, for themselves. And it spans across every area in terms of schools that were sent, in terms of clinics that were being built, in terms of roads, road networks that were started in my constituency during my time, nobody has ever had it before. In terms of high profile projects, like a whole sea defense project that was being done never before, um, was an irrigation project never before. 
you know, uh, the completion of a metro mass so transit. So you've done a lot so for them. Quite a lot, quite a lot. I see. Good. Again, the, the report uh, recommended a peace uh, making and a healing uh, tour headed by credible and eminent, the used old West, credible and eminent personalities in the party. How effective, um, Fifi, do you think that, you know, the, such a tour will um, help to unite um, every member uh, of the party? I mean, it's definitely an effort, and I think we need to applaud that effort. As I said, uh, unity doesn't just come about because of um, the setting up of any such um, group of high-profile people. The real unity comes when individuals in a party make an effort to appreciate that it's a party is not a perfect organization. <laughs> it's made up of human beings, and therefore mistakes will be made. But what is important is to be able to rise above some of those, uh, shall I call it, um, imperfect arts and see the bigger goal. So does that of mean that it said perfect and uh, eminent people and credible? So does mm -hmm. that mean, or can we all assume that you know, um, the committee felt, you know, some people are not credible in the party? Can we assume that you know you have leaders or personalities who are not credible in, in the party? Mm -hmm. I I think that would be that would be a bit far fetched. I mean, in every group, uh, let's even assume that in a party made up of let's say one million credible people, some will be more credible than others. So instead of looking at it as good and bad, let's look at it as good and better. So we have extremely credible. It doesn't mean the others are not credible. It just means that some are more credible, I at see. least from the analysis of those who made the choices. So uh, I think that should be the way we view it. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Hard Truth. And we're still have in the studio uh, Fifi Fiavi Franklin Quete. He's a member of parliament for K2 South. Now, Fifi, the key, again, recommendation of the report was uh, the need for the NDC to reconnect uh, with its social democratic philosophy. What do you think of, um, you know, to lead this or is there a disconnect in the first place? I feel the country as a whole need to have a, a better understanding of uh, social democracy. Do we understand, or I let's say I do think, the party I think is, members understand? I think even social within, democracy. I think even within the party, a lot of people don't really understand it, because you know, human beings, we tend to sometimes just um, parrot words without really knowing the true meaning of them. Now, so in our context, social democracy really just means um, everybody, everything should really be free. Yeah. We should really pay very little for everything. I mean, everybody who is everybody who is uh, everybody who is if, if poor this should what have What you are everything. saying, I mean, uh, yes, uh, didn't we see the opposite? No, but that's the truth. But while, while in office, some of us quite, uh, I mean, made a lot of effort. Because you see what? If you enter into countries that have been known for social democracy, if you go to Denmark, you go to Norway, you go to Sweden, those countries that are known for social democracy, they're the countries where people pay the highest taxes. Yeah. In our part of the world, when you mention social democracy, the assumption is that taxes must reduce. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So what if the social are crying for social democracy for reduction of taxes or reducing, you know, you cannot eat your reduction. cake and have it. That's why in the social democratic country they appreciate that if you want to have a certain level of welfare, and which welfare is also directed towards those who temporarily are vulnerable, not this situation where people make themselves become permanently vulnerable. So temporarily you are vulnerable. High taxes are being paid by those who are working, both in the corporate and as individuals. And then that, those taxes are now used to be able to help those who temporarily can afford. But if, if, that if, is social if, if you were yeah. to increase taxes mm -hmm. and not borrow, that would have been okay. But you are increasing and borrowing more money. <laughs> I wish that way you are taking us into a whole discussion of economics. Uh, I think I don't think anybody will go and then just uh, borrow for the sake of borrowing. You borrow because there are important needs that the people are asking for. 
the people in my constituency were crying for a sea defense project. Now, if you have to give them that sea defense project, you need to be able to raise the money. And it couldn't have done it been done internally. No, you couldn't. You couldn't raise taxes in Ghana to do some of those projects. Don't forget, virtually all the taxes we were raising in this country, almost all of it was paying just public sector workers. That was consuming virtually all your revenue, at least between 2013 and 2014. If you look at the public sector wage, the arrears, and then the complete compensation package, that alone together was gulping almost 95% of the taxes of, of the country. You have very little left to be able to do any other thing. So, uh, then again, I think it's a, it's a whole um, unfortunate politicking that is going on which is like, you know, in order to come to power, you need to create um, all kinds of um, mystery around borrowing and make it look as if borrowing per se is a problem. One of the reasons why I have not bothered so much to talk about MPP's borrowing is because fundamentally I know that every government will borrow. You will borrow. Because if you want to bring development, you need to borrow. So me borrowing per se is not a problem. It is what you use the money for that should be the issue. Yeah. If, for example, I go and make uh, borrowing and I use the borrowing maybe to go and procure maybe spare parts, like, for example, MPP did when they were in power the previous time, mm -hmm. then there's a problem. If I go and borrow, let's say, from the financial market and I use part of it, for example, to pay workers, then there's a problem. That's not good enough. But if, for example, I go and borrow and I come and set up what you call the, uh, 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 the gas processing. So for a fact, every, uh, every government who need Absolutely. some level of borrowing. Absolutely. Now, going Absolutely. back to um, 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 social democracy, mm -hmm. talking about a disconnect, are sure. you saying? Yeah, so I'm saying that we need to understand it. I think we have a wrong understanding of social democracy. That's why you expect, for example, that, oh, he's, they are social democrats, so they shouldn't increase taxes. Who says so? Social democratic countries increase taxes. In fact, they need a lot of taxes because the kind of welfare that the citizen is asking for, there's no way that can happen except you increase taxes. Now, so if you have a situation where as a result of misconception, people expect that, for example, free education, free health, free these, yet at the same time, taxes must go lower, you absolutely are going to just destroy your country. It doesn't happen anywhere. So there must be a clarity, there must be a proper illumination as to what social democracy is about. If we don't have that, then we have all kinds of very uh, wrong understanding of social democracy. And in the process, what happens is this, political leaders will continue uh, making promises that they can never fulfill. So, for example, they come promising, you know, when I come, we'll reduce taxes. At the same time, we're going to make sure education is going to be affordable. We're going to make sure that is going to be affordable. It's not so possible. So that can go hand in hand. It can't. It doesn't prior happen to, anywhere. Prior to the release of the report, um, your General Secretary, uh, uh, Johnson Nasir Dunkitia, indicated that some ministers under uh, the Mahama government did not understand, again, the social democratic philosophy of, of the party. Do you share his, his stance? Or, you know, are you before not, that? I'm are not, you... I'm I had an opportunity to to maybe discuss with him what exactly he meant. Because yeah. there again, there needs to be clarity. Yeah. Is it this whole thing called social democracy? It must be clarified. But, what, but is, I, what is really I don't know, democracy? but are you part of those ministers? Sir? Can I ask if you're I part don't know, of them? I don't know what that's what I'm saying. If I knew what he meant, then I would know whether I'm part or not. Hmm. I don't know what social democracy means. Because I mean, don't forget, we also are coming from a certain tradition where it was assumed that socialists are supposed to I mean, go to offices wearing chaliwate and wear tattered clothing, then that makes them socialists. I mean, that's nothing but lies. This is a blatant hypocrisy. So I don't know where that is the kind of perception. Or we're talking about accumulation of, of, of what you call, or what I call ill-gotten wealth. Mm -hmm. If that's a, then that's a whole different discussion. And those, those are discussions that are related to law. So I'm not really sure what, um, to be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not privy to that particular statement of uh, the General Secretary, so I can't really comment on it at all. Franklin, what's your um, assessment of the current leadership of your party? What's your, what's your assessment of it? No, like every, like every leadership, I think there are, there are people who are very good and others too who can do better. You know, I'm particularly always very, uh, extremely happy about the General Secretary. He's, uh, he's an individual I've worked with. I mean, I, mean, I would say we, are, we became leaders of the party together. 
he was general secretary at the same congress when I became propaganda secretary for my party. And it's an individual I have a lot of respect for and a lot of the colleagues who work with him too. So I'm saying, like every organization, some can do much better. I think, for example, that the communication of the party could be far, far better than it was. Former President Rawlings feels that um, the NDC needs fresh leadership in the party. Otherwise, um, the party shall, you know, sink further down. Do you think he's wrong or what's, what's your take on, 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 on this? I think uh, infusion of new blood is always a good idea. There's nothing wrong with that. Should you start from again, the top? Should you start from the presidency? Where? Um, I don't particularly feel it's my place to, to, to make those uh, decisions on behalf of the party. I think when it comes to general leadership, it should always be individuals, first and foremost, who are committed to the party, individuals who clearly have a greater agenda, not just for party, but for the country, and uh, who obviously will be able to command the respect of the people of Ghana. That really should be. I don't think we should say, if you are fresh, therefore you are better, or if you are old, therefore you are better. I don't think that really should be an, an either or situation. I want to understand, mm -hmm. is there a spirit, you know, once a party or a government comes into power, is there a spirit, is there an arrogant spirit that enters into people? So you, Fifi, right now I'm talking to you. Mm -hmm. Next four years, some miracle happens, mm -hmm. NPP lost, Fifi comes to power, Fifi come for the interview, mm -hmm. and then you are God now. I want to really, I mean, is there something that happens to you so you're an ordinary person now and then he's a minister for agriculture and then, you know, the spirit enters you and what is it? We all want to understand. Uh, I don't, it's true, it's true that, like, like you said often, I mean, you don't know a human being until that person has power or wealth, okay? And so that's when the real personality shows. But I don't think that when people find themselves in position and they are not able to do some of the things they used to do, that means necessarily that they are arrogant, no. Oftentimes, they have far, far more responsibility. So they can't do some of the things that previously were being done. Two, there could be other reasons relating to, for example, objective of the, of, the, of the group. So an individual is not supposed to be speaking because the group doesn't want the individual to speak or the group doesn't want particular statement to come. So you need to, as it were, enter into the details in order to know. Hmm. Yeah, but that's the truth that generally, uh, it's not just in Ghana, but all over the world. No, but, but human beings tend, tend to, to We We spoke to, to um, um, I wouldn't say, we spoke to quite a number of, of your grassroots from the NDC. Mm -hmm. And most of them, from what they said, would say 98% of, of them felt that um, some of the young ministers were arrogant and um, they didn't want to relate to them. I mean, what would you say to it? You know, you ask for accusations of um, that nature, you always hear it. It's not about even young or old. It's about the fact that people feel uh, if uh, you and I uh, used to uh, talk to each other every day, and now that you're in office, I can't talk to you every day, it means you're arrogant. I mean, you hear that. It's normal, you know. I don't particularly think um, those blatant uh, labeling is right, you know, because individuals differ. Uh, some individuals uh, 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 will remain the same, whether in office or not. Some individuals, when they enter in office, they change. So different people have different comportment. But I don't also think that the, the fact, for example, that you try to get access to an individual, you can means that the individual is arrogant. No. The committee contends that the a party has a weak intellectual and research base. In your personal view, does the NDC have enough critical thinkers within the party? Uh, I think you might be misconstruing that a bit because I don't, I, don't, I don't think what the party is saying has anything to do with uh, absence of intellectuals or absence of uh, people, I mean, with uh, the necessary um, um, embodiment of knowledge. I don't think that's what it is at all. I think it's talking more in terms of the party itself having a good research uh, uh, committee that will be in charge of putting together information, I mean, for the sake of the party. That is not a problem that's starting today. I would say that that was the biggest problem I even face, I face, 
as a, uh, somebody who was in charge of NDC's communication. In fact, that was the reason why when I was communication boss of the NDC, I was forced to start what I call the NDC Forum for setting the record straight. Because waiting for the party uh, structure itself to put together a reset team was impossible. So you needed to now put together a team of people that you can really uh, do research on your own and put it together. Mm. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perennial problem of the party, and I think it must be addressed. It's not lack of individuals with knowledge. It's rather he said it lacks, it lacks intellectual base and research. He said that. That was what the report said. That what? That what? I mean, the word you use is what? Is what? Intellectual I, base and research. That it lacks. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's, that's what it was meant to, 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 to convey. Because Dr. Boitri himself is quite a giant. Now, should that, should, so that, should that report, like or should the Christy Boitri report, do, do, in your view, do you think it should be made public? Should everybody have a uh, you know, peek at it, or we should all look at it? Should it be made public? I think uh, it's meant for the NDC. Are you an NDC? So the NDC people should, should be privy to it. No, but the NDC, it's, I mean, they have the minority, and the minority is the, is the largest position in Ghana, and it's, it's a lot of people. I so know. how do you disclose to but your party members? this is for the chamber. This? If you're not in the chamber, you don't know about it. You are in the veranda, so please be in the veranda. We let the chamber people discuss that, and whatever the recommendations are, they will learn it. What do you mean I'm in the veranda? No, I'm not saying you as an individual. I'm talking about those who are not yes, members so, of the party. Yes, so all of us, those who are not. Anyway, no. you, you can't things, say that. There are, there are things you keep within because you need to be able to correct things within. It's not everything you come and discuss without. The things that are meant for without, we'll bring them without, but those that are meant for within, we keep it within. When we meet our branch members and meet our constituency members and the people who are working for us in the region and the national, you we can discuss them. those things with them. But, but not to the not whole nation. Never, no, because you'll be giving your opponents a lot of information that you don't need to give them. I see. Mm -hmm. But you have, you know, served as uh, Deputy Minister for Finance mm -hmm. and uh, Minister for Food and Agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, which of these ministries, yeah, you know, did you find? Challenging, yeah. I found a portfolio as Minister of Transport. Uh, I would say all of them were, were quite uh, uh, big challenges. Uh, of course, Minister of Finance is always going to be the biggest, I mean, and also the most challenging, because really that's a heart ministry at all moments. Um, Ministry of Agriculture also faces own challenges, because agriculture, the worst part is uh, no matter what you do by way of uh, policy, one bad weather can literally ruin everything you've done. So that itself is a challenge that Africa will continue to face until we are able to make a transition out of uh, rain-fed agriculture mm -hmm. into, into... Yeah, transport was also... Uh, transport was quite um, uh, uh, challenging as well, even though the constraint of resources uh, that, uh, for example, Minister of Agriculture had, transport was relatively not facing too mm -hmm. much of that because transport had access to quite a lot of uh, facilities to be able to do a number of uh, high profile projects. Cool. So I would say transport relatively. Which one uh, did you enjoy? Here. I like this one. Which one was it? To be honest, I like all three. Aren't because you? for me, because for me, all, all three gave you uh, opportunity to be able to like uh, understand different facets of government. And you so, being modest. No, no, no. All three, all three were great. Honest, all three were were, were beautiful. And I, I kind of feel uh, in all those three places as well, I left, um, I left imprints, I touched people, mm -hmm. I interacted with people, and uh, I'm sure some of those people will also be happy that I passed through those three places. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Fifi, Fiavi, uh, Quete, Franklin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Many names. Yeah. It's all, in our studio. Apps, all apps. I know. Mm -hmm. So FQ? Uh, for friends, for family, and for foes. Oh. Mm -hmm. I say, but Fifi, you authored a book uh, titled Golden Keys uh, for Successful Living, and uh, which you launched uh, to mark your 50th birthday. Anyway, mm -hmm. happy birthday. When was this? Second June. Second June. Yeah, oh, I owe you a, a big, a big um, um, parcel. I'm, I'm waiting for it. Good. But <laughs> what motivated you in the first place to, to write um, this book and what were you hoping to accomplish or achieve with it? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, let me say that um, I've always had this passion for 
what I call um, helping to bring transformation mm -hmm. to our society. I would say that largely was what made me enter into politics. Um, but what I noticed also is that politics as a vehicle has a limitation mm. because it's unable to, shall I call it, touch the death that I have been hoping that we could touch. What politics does really is all about management of the resources of the country, creating the security, providing the environment, bringing about what you call social and economic um, and political uh, um, infrastructure that will make people uh, do what they've got to do. But the more essential part is not that. The really essential part has to do with values, attitudes, and mindset of people. Uh, no matter what you create, in terms of um, the right political or even economic infrastructure, if the individuals don't have the proper mindset, the proper values, the proper attitudes, but, but if you've, looking you've at effectively your, wasted, wasted right. your time. But look, looking at your background, mm -hmm. you know, you have an economic and uh, financial background, mm -hmm. and you know, you've worked for a number of years, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as an in the investment banking industry. Mm -hmm. uh, one could have expected, I was expecting mm -hmm. to see you all in a book on economic and mm -hmm. financial dynamics. Mm -hmm. So why isn't that the case? It's not the case because um, the truth is, uh, the main reason why we are behind, mm. especially in Africa, is not because we lack people with the knowledge of economics or the knowledge of finances or the knowledge of business. The major reasons why we are behind is because we actually are lacking individuals with the proper mindset, with the proper attitudes, with the proper values. Now, so if we want to really build an enduring edifice, mm. we need to have the foundations right. And the foundation true. has to do with letting the individual understand how he, as mm. an individual, is an important, important key in making the society becoming great and strong. Right. Now, so I feel this being, uh, um, I call it the, my reflections, my thought about the society. So you see one chapter that's totally devoted to what I call societal transformation. Mm. Coming to that, yeah. yes. What, what kind of transformation, you know, do you want the society to embrace? Um, it's important to appreciate that uh, a, a, a solid, thriving society is one that has um, reached that level where people place the collective interest ahead of the personal interest. Uh, I tell people all the time that if you want to see the level of evolution of our society vis-a-vis -vis another society, just observe what happens when we reach traffic light in Ghana and the lights are not functioning and there's no policeman. That tells you it's just one shot of our evolution. Total mayhem is what you see. Because what you see there is basically are individuals who are concerned about nothing but themselves. Everybody just wants to go. A journey that could take two minutes or maximum five minutes sometimes ends up taking two hours. It's our level of evolution. We have not reached that moment to understand that for us together to thrive, we need to look at the collective interest rather than our personal interest. Now, if you place such individuals in different positions, it's the same problem you have. So, so in because, what ways? Because they don't, they don't understand that the collective interest must be number yeah, one. I want to understand the, the, play, the role government will play. What, what can government do to ensure or to make this uh, transformation a reality? You see, that's where we go wrong. Because we tend to think that government holds a magic key for every problem. No, that's not the case. This, if you read the book, the book places emphasis on a number of institutions that are critical to bring in this uh, reality. The first and most important is a family. Because that is where the molding of the individual starts, the family. Today what we have in a situation where the family is abdicating a lot of that role and somehow placing that role on other institutions to do. So basic set of morals 
basic issues relating to values, relating to attitudes, that must be shaped within the home. Somehow, people are that. And think, that's important. Right. Beyond that, you're looking at the school. Beyond that, we look at another very important institution that today is almost far, far, far more important than any other, and that is the church, or if you call it a religious organization. Now, these three are so, so strong in molding values, shaping mindset, and helping our attitudes. Right. And oftentimes, once you get it wrong at that level, it's like the seed has a problem. So it's a and, once, and once the seed has a problem, by the time you are, you are complaining about the fruit, it's too late because the fruit is just a consequence of the real thing, which has to do with the seed. Homeschool religious bodies. Critical. I see that several people, uh, Fifi, you know, they've described you as an uh, arrogant, rude, and a liar, and uh, a propagandist, and, you know, among other, you know, uh, other names. Mm -hmm. You have stated in your book again that the courage to tell the truth mm -hmm. uh, begins with the courage to accept the truth about oneself. Mm -hmm. You know, in self-reflection again, what actions and inactions of yours, you know, led to this perception? I'm wondering. Perceptions will always be there because the thing is that human beings, we tend to judge a book by its cover. Uh, we don't really take time to know people. We just assume on the back of maybe the little information we know. So in your life also, you must understand, you shouldn't worry too much about perceptions. Mm. Jesus was called um, a wine beaver. Mm. Some call <laughs> him some call him a demon-possessed man who was operating in Beelzebub. Others call him a companion of prostitutes and gluttons. Now, so in life, you must appreciate perceptions will be there. But you must be true to yourself. You must know who you are. And for me, that's always so important. And knowing yourself means being honest with yourself. You're not knowing, all of that. Knowing, it's just an knowing, opinion of people. There's no one who is perfect. You know, so naturally uh, you have imperfections. I come across as arrogant. The reason is because in our society, people don't like people who are too frontal and would like to tell the truth and call things as they are. The program is called The Hard Truth. Right. And that's really me. Mm. I say exactly what I believe, no matter what the situation is. And in Africa, we don't like people who are too much like that. We find them too brazen, too straightforward. Because our society likes people who literally do their, what you call, the serpentine business, going around about the bush. They can't tell you the truth. I see. So naturally, if you are a bit too straightforward, you are called arrogant. Um, so that you can't do much with. But those who truly know me will know that. He's there's a great nothing, guy. There's nothing far He's a great from guy. the truth. Fifi, yeah. let's go to chapter 7 of, uh, sorry, chapter 2, page mm -hmm. 37 of your page. You said, we waste so much time and energy competing uh, each other, uh, other than the only thing that truly matters, how we can complete um, each other. Relating this to our, our polarized political mm -hmm. landscape, mm -hmm. why do the NDC, you know, always find, uh, or is always finding fault with NPP and vice versa? I think it's because we, we, decided to embrace uh, what I call the adversarial politicking. And like we do all the time, we just copy blindly. Uh, because we saw what's happening in America between the Democrats and Republicans. And what's happening in the UK between the Conservatives and the Labour Party. So typical copycat, we copy them. We copy them without realizing that, that those are countries where this has been practiced for hundreds of years. And therefore they've had certain what I call um, established development already. Now we are at a certain level of development where we simply cannot afford to continue having four years, and within that four years, there's a group that's almost like 50% of the country that is virtually praying, hoping, orchestrating for the failure of the other. Yeah. And as soon as they change it, the other does exactly the same thing. Uh, it's one of the things the book seeks to address and one of the things that I personally feel strong about that we need to start making a transition. What has happened to you? You've changed. I mean, the I've Fifi, no, you have. have because I'm surprised it's because, that you, it's because, you would it's really always find faults, no, you know, no, with, with the opposition, no, especially when they're no, no, in no, opposition. That, that's not to say that you cannot say things as they are. No, but, you can. You can say things as they are. You can say things as they are. Condemning every act and everything oh, that's not true. that they do. No, that's not true. That's not true at all. I'm listening. That's not true at all. I mean, I've, I'm the type. If I feel, for example, I still feel very strongly that uh, certain promises made are absolutely wrong. Mm. That you shouldn't make those promises. And of course, I do agree also. Which ones? That I do agree. Which ones? Which promises? You mean made by the MPP? Yeah. 
if for example you make the statement that when you come you will be able to reduce taxes at the same time you'll be able to provide everything free like education you obviously set yourself for trouble in that trouble you're going to start noticing it as soon as they have the courage to want to roll out the uh, free education at the second level, yeah. you'll see the trouble starting to come. Because, you see, we need to rise above the need to lie to get power. And that, for me, is a problem. And I have that problem also in the NDC. Because having, uh, MPP having used what you call these false promises to be able to get power, there's quite a lot of what you call pressure within my own party. Let's do exactly what they've done. But and when we continue that, the country becomes worse for it. So at a certain stage, there must be people within both parties who can rise and say, you know what, we have to, to have the courage to do what is right, even if doing what is right means not winning power. That's the only way the country is going to get better, and that must happen. In the spirit of, you know, completing each other, yeah. will you, Fifi, Fiavi, Franklin, mm -hmm. Quete, accept an offer by the NB, MPP government to serve in an official capacity, say a minister? I don't need to complete MPP by simply serving with them. No, that's not completing doesn't mean that you need to work necessarily with them. Completing, for example, means when, for example, a good idea has been brought by the MPP, I shouldn't say this is the wrong idea. I should, for example, say, you know what, this is a good idea. But I think I have a proposal that actually can make this idea better. Would you actually share that proposal with them? Once I make it public, everybody knows this is my proposal. So that goes to my credit. I see. So I don't need to hold it. If I tell the whole country, you know what, in terms of, let's say, energy generation, this is my proposal coming from the NDC and make it public. People know it's mine. If MPP subsequently decide to pick it, the country knows that this proposal came from me. I think we can reach that stage. So that when something is obviously good, you don't need to oppose it simply because you're in opposition. In your view, what you know will you have changed within the um, NDC for the party to recapture power in, in 2020? What, what changes do you want to see, you know, to recapture power? Uh, let me rather say that I want to see um, not just the NDC, both the NDC and the MPP, uh, moving more and more to the politics of truth rather than the politics of convenience. I think on both sides, there's too much of the politics of convenience. The politics of convenience is the one that says, you know what, well, if I say this, I will win power, so let me say that. It's because somehow we believe people are not ready to hear the truth. So if, for example, if I told, because if I told you that if I came to office, I'll be able to achieve this, but not that you won't vote for me. So I will tell you I'll be able to achieve all. I think we need to have increasing uh, capacity to see exactly what it is we can do, given the genuine resources, as opposed to making claims that we cannot fulfill. Because I think the, the one thing about this world is uh, whatever you sow, you tend to reap. And if you're sowing lies, you may be winning in the short term, but over the medium to long term, you are going to be exposed. Spio Therefore, Gabra, it's good to tell the truth. Right. Spio Gabra, Babin, Joshua Labi, Sylvester Mensah, and John Dramani Mahama. Who would you prefer as a flag bearer for 2020? I think it's early in the day to, to come to terms with uh, leadership. I think the party needs to go through the whole process of um, uh, looking at the underlying issues that brought the difficulty, as opposed to looking at individuals. I think we should focus more on principles for now. And then when that moment comes, we'll be able to look at Will you be happy? But, but what, I would say, what I would say among those people you mentioned is this. If a primary is held in the NDC, hmm. John Mahama will beat them. If primary is held in the NDC, John Mahama will beat them. Who would you prefer? It doesn't matter who I prefer. I'm telling you who will win if a primary so is if, held. If, if, and those if President, President Mahama says, okay, I'm taking the back seat. If Mahama is not present, then of course. It's possible you may even get many more people than those you've mentioned. And I'm because sure. I think, I think, a, lot, I think, a, lot, I think a lot of people, a lot of people out of respect for President Mahama would not uh, be uh, putting themselves out for leadership. But the moment President Mahama says he's not going to run, you, I think we'll have a lot more people who will present. Themselves. What are the chances? We are, people are, especially for the grassroots, 
of the N NDC. W what are the chances that the party can, can come back, especially? They are saying, oh, four years just around the corner. Is it possible? What are the chances? I think, given the historical um, uh, antecedent we have in the country, it looks like it's a country that's almost going eight year, eight year, eight year. So in that respect, uh, the situation is to say eight year looks pro the probable situation, but you give it your best shot. You never know. You, Ghana might decide. To, so he's to, saying to, forget to, to change, grassroots eight years. So uh, uh, NPP should stay on for what? No, so I said given 2016 to 2024. I said given the historical antecedent, eight year looks like what it does, but. Who knows? MPP might absolutely just mess have up. a spectacular uh, messing up because of the huge promises they made. And the people of Ghana will say, you know what? Enough with these people. So pay, pay that. So even if they mess up, they still have four years to go. No, okay, necessarily. If it's a spectacular messing up, the people of Ghana would actually make their mind. Mm. Uh, but uh, otherwise, if we wanted to go with the history, it looked like that could be another eight years, yes. Fifi, thank you very much for talking to the Hard Show. Fifi Fiavi Franklin Kwete is a member of, uh, sorry, the MP for K2 South Constituency. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, his book is The Golden Keys for Successful uh, Living. And uh, it's a great book. I, mean, I, I read it the whole of last night. And then it has some fantastic quotes. Um, let me just whet your appetite by reading one of it. He said, are you celebrating your birthday? Have you even sought to know why you are alive or you are on this journey? Are you traveling to a desired destination and uh, or where are you going to nowhere? It's a great quote. It's a great quote and I think you should get this with Golden Keys for Successful Living by Fifi Fiavi Franklin Quete. You've been watching The Heart Truth. Let's follow the conversation. You can go to um, our YouTube page, you can go to um, our Facebook page and my personal page is The Heart Truth um, on, on Facebook and Akusia Kunidu, it's my personal handle, Instagram and all of that. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Nana Akusia Kunidu Samuels and have a good evening. Bye.